Hey everybody, it's Ryan and Joe, and I'm about to lose my cat. <laughs> and today we're going to talk about... There's still his tail. <laughs> today we're going to talk about different schools or approaches to astrology. So after you reach a certain level, like basic understanding of astrology, and you start to kind of explore out there a little bit more, you'll run into different sort of paths or schools of astrology that are out there. And today we're going to talk about sort of the four big ones that are our popular currently. So the four main approaches that you'll probably run into are modern psychological astrology. That one's super big and super readily available online. Evolutionary astrology, also pretty popular right now, started gaining popularity, you know, 30 some years ago. Traditional astrology, you'll see a lot of people saying they're traditional astrologers. You'll hear terms like whole sign houses that are often associated with that and Vedic astrology. Those are kind of the main four that you'll see big differences in when you kind of explore these different approaches. And that's the video. Okay. No. <laughs> that's it. So our goal today was just to sort of talk about these four and kind of characterize them a little bit to kind of get a sense of like what they're for, kind of what's different about them, because it can be kind of weird to be like, oh, you mean there's not just like one true system of astrology? Because there isn't, no matter how strongly some of us believe that that is actually the case. So the first big one, like Joe mentioned, is modern psychological astrology. And this one is really popular now. Like it's sort of the most prolific kind of astrology. Psychological astrology really focuses on the idea of the, like the astrological chart being reflection of like the person's psyche. Like everything in the chart is sort of like an internal process that happens like in here or in here or wherever you think the psyche is and it's sort of reflected outwards. Right, right. Um, it focuses on internal processes and you see this with even how they talk about the significations of the planets. Like the moon is how you feel, Mercury how you think, think Venus would be how you love or relate. or relate and Mars would be like how you take action, that kind of thing. All really internal and not about external processes or things in your life mm -hmm. as much as the your inner life and how you operate psychologically, hence the name. This system of astrology really started with Alan Leo in the late 1800s who sort of took this concept and push it forward and it eventually got augmented and sort of delved more into by like Jungian psychology and it kind of became the big thing that is today but that's sort of where the genesis of the psychological astrology movement um, is with these individuals. So if you want to read more about the founders if you will or the first people who started really making psychological astrology a thing and kind of how we practice it today uh, look into Alan Leo, Dane Rujar. Howard Sesperatus kind of yeah, founded the yeah. school of psychological astrology in England. And so like it's another person to look into. The second big school would be the evolutionary school. And this one is also somewhat actually really modern. It's the youngest school on the list. And the evolutionary school is a bit more spiritual. Well, not a bit more. Like more spiritually spiritual, focused yeah. and its focus on natal chart delineation is supposed to be on your soul's journey. Mm -hmm. The understanding that our souls have incarnated several times and that they're just trying to understand what this incarnation sort of purpose is, like what we brought in from the past life and what you you know, are sort of moving towards in this life to sort of wrap up whatever story that this life is supposed to be about. Like I said, that essentially necessitates a, a belief in reincarnation, which is not necessary for to be an astrologer in general. Right. So if you're wondering if what you're reading about or looking at is evolutionary astrology, a big key thing is you'll see a lot of focus on the nodes, the south node being past lives and where you came from and what you brought with you to this life and the north node being your destiny or where you're going, kind of the direction you need to go to move away from your south node, as it were, and mm -hmm. towards your north node and kind of fulfill whatever your soul is here for in this incarnation. You'll also see a lot of focus on Pluto. There's even a school called the Pluto School, yeah. which is an evolutionary school. Pluto being very much, you know, about transformation and like kind of the deepest parts of you and things like that. So if you see that kind of thing, you may be doing evolutionary astrology or reading about it. The school started in the 1970s, was founded by a man named Jeffrey Wolf Green. You can go and read some of his books about the subject if you're interested in that. Uh, Stephen Forrest also yeah, that's another big came one. up with like a derivative version or is it similar? Um, you know, I don't know how derivative okay, it is, well, but so. like Stephen Forrest is an evolutionary astrologer and, and like he's, he's a got a lot of great, writer. yeah, he's got um, a lot of great work, work on that. So that would be, you know, if you if you want to learn more about that, go that way. The third big school is traditional astrology, which is m much older than the aforementioned schools by yes. a long shot. Traditional astrology is typically defined as the astrology that was practiced between 400 BCE 
to around 1700 CE, so you know, a good chunk of time. Very big there. chunk of time. Some people, to some others' dismay, call it like the original form of astrology, of like Western astrology as we practice it, because it's like if you go as far back as you can and try to find where people had like the circular chart, like a natal chart, you find that around 400 BCE. And so that's like horoscopic astrology started in that time and place and was practiced that way from 400 BCE to about 1700 CE. So that's kind of where we get that. So because traditional astrology sort of encompasses a large period of time, like almost 2000 years, it tends to be subdivided into like three specific periods that are sort of under the umbrella of traditional astrology. Each one is slightly different in that they, you know, they take place in different time periods. So they have one another to sort of build off on. The first one is Hellenistic astrology, which focuses on the astrology as it was practiced in Hellenistic Greece from like 400 CE to around, or I'm sorry, 400 BCE, that's different, to around 400 <laughs> CE. And from there we go to the medieval period, which is more about astrology as it developed in the Middle East under the Arabic culture before it came to Western Europe. And then the Renaissance tradition of astrology, which was from like around 1500 CE to 1700 CE. Like I said, they all tend to be kind of similar, but there are like slight developmental differences. Right, it's just so like what happens when you take like a practicing art and science form and like practice it over 2000 years. It's gonna be a little bit different. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit different, but there are like a few things that the umbrella term of traditional astrology kind of covers. Probably the biggest one and what differentiates it from especially modern psychological astrology is that the natal chart represents your life, not just you mm -hmm. and not just what happens inside of you. So where modern psychological astrology might say the moon is how you feel or the moon is how you feel about your mother, that's a common one. The traditional approach would say the moon literally represents your mother, mm -hmm. the actual person. Same with something like the seventh house. So a psychological approach might say the seventh house is how is like what you project onto a partner or like how you view partners or like how you what approach you're partnership. For in a partner. Yeah, what you're looking for in a partnership. And a traditional approach would say the seventh house or and like the ruler of the seventh house or planets there literally describe your partners and your relationships. This gives it a much more literal feel and sometimes fatalistic feel. And that's one of the huge things that you'll notice if you kind of start to study or get into traditional astrology more. So there's Hellenistic astrology, medieval astrology, Renaissance astrology. That's one of the main themes that you'll see through all of those is more of a literal external event approach. That said, there are still ways to study and learn about internal processes within this kind of technique or approach. But um, that's one thing you'll notice a lot is it focuses a lot more on the life and the circumstances of the native as well as the native's personality. Another big telltale sign of traditional astrologers is the downplay of Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Right. Um, and that's a pretty big sign. It's a pretty huge <laughs> sign. And like the most obvious reason that it's downplayed is when traditional astrology, these different kinds were being practiced, we did not know about the outer planets. Mm -hmm. So they're not incorporated into these systems and techniques. However, that said, you'll find a lot of traditional yeah, it's astrologers. It's handled in different ways. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you'll find a ton of traditional astrologers who use Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto, but they don't incorporate them into systems like you might see in more modern approaches, such as they don't give rulership to these outer planets. They stick with the traditional classical seven planets as rulers of the signs, etc, etc. So that's another telltale sign. But another big indication that what you're reading is traditional astrology is if they talk about different branches of astrology, yes. which is like different ways that astrology can be applied to things. So traditional astrology, you know, we all know about natal astrology, which is the astrology of like birth charts, like, you know, that's kind of how we usually all get into astrology. But traditional astrology has, you know, like a natal chart branch where you do natal charts and what's called um, continuous horoscopy, what we would call transits now, but like a much different and much more stuff. Yeah. Um, and then we have like horary astrology, which is the astrology of asking and answering specific questions or getting insight into specific problems, which is absent from psychological and evolutionary astrologies. Also, like, electional astrology, picking times to do things under the best astrological conditions. That's a yeah, traditional yeah. thing. There's, like, a whole tradition of astrological magic, which is sort of like a combination of religious ideas with ancient astrology. 
and oh mundane astrology which is sort of like the astrology of world affairs like predicting elections in countries or wars and mm-hmm, things like that mm-hmm. so you will see that with with yeah, modern mundane. practices too you know like there's a there are plenty of mundane astrologers who focus on the outer planets but mm-hmm. but there's a there's a traditional mundane astrology like branch within the tradition yeah. that's what we're saying traditional astrology kind of became a big thing again in the 1990s with project hindsight going yeah. back in like a lot of the problem with traditional um, astrological texts is that they are written in greek arabic and latin and so we needed individuals to go back and retry and like to translate those into English and sort of reintroduce them into the astrological community because for a couple of hundred years there were certain legal, political, and sociological reasons why astrology sort of got downplayed. And so we kind of lost that link to our past. And so we had Project Hindsight go back and help us connect back with that. So that's why it might seem, it's kind of like one of those things, well, if it's so old, why isn't it like the most well-known? Like right, this is right. why it just well, we lost it. This is it. why, like it, it was kind of lost and then found like really recently. Like mm-hmm. the '90s weren't that long ago when you think. Like when you think about 400 BC was a long time <laughs> ago. The 1990s were it was not that long ago. So we're just now getting these texts and being able to understand these concepts and techniques the way they were meant to be understood because we have these translations now. So there is kind of like a traditional renaissance happening. So if you want to learn more about traditional astrology or, you know, where to go from there, Ben Dykes has written a whole bunch of different translations of Latin and Arabic works, so go there. Things written by Project Hindsight, Robert Zoller, Robert Hand, Robert Hand post 1990s. <laughs> and that's that's where a lot of that literature comes from. But the final school of thought is Vedic astrology, and this one is like really popular in India, which is where it's native to. So like India and the what we would call the Far East probably. And it's actually very related to traditional astrology. They sort of come from the same parent. It's just like what happens when you take like Hellenistic Greek astrology and make it grow up in a Hindu culture. Because when you study Vedic astrology and look at the techniques that you're learning, you'll see a lot of similarities with traditional Western astrology. One thing you'll definitely notice right off the bat is that Vedic astrologers usually use the sidereal zodiac almost exclusively. There, you know, there are some exceptions there, but that's one big one. So if you look at your chart with the tropical zodiac like you often will find if you're looking at western astrology which you probably are then look at your vedic chart you'll see a lot of this you'll see the same kind of planetary configurations but the signs will probably be different Mm -hmm. that's because they're using a different zodiac so vedic astrology is kind of regarded as much more directly divinely inspired sort of like handed to humanity by some sort of divine figure and it also helps that hinduism is still the predominant culture of india so it's still deeply connected the people of india and vedic astrologers in general, are much more immediately connected to the religious ideas that were woven into and developed with their astrology, whereas in the West, we kind of lost it because of the advent of Christianity, but that's a whole other thing. So that's why it can kind of come across as, I think a lot of people in the West would see it more as like superstitious. Yeah. When it's really just Mm -hmm. like a different method of like religious exercise right it's just culturally so different like you said it's kind of like the same astrology as like traditional western astrology but like raised in india and far east and that's yeah there's just such a big cultural difference that it could seem more superstitious or a little just different and more exotic than Mm -hmm. western astrology for that reason so if you want to learn more about vedic astrology there's a book that's been recommended to us called light on life and so definitely go and check that one out. So those are the four big prominent different schools of thought with astrology. It's important to note that like, there's no right one. There will be people who advocate for the kind that they practice and have really good reasons on all sides that theirs is the best or theirs works the best. But when it comes down to it, all of these work for people and they work in different ways in a different context. So it's just good to be aware that there are different ways to do astrology and apply astrology. And there's no right one. You just gotta, you know, research and read about these different approaches and kind of see which one resonates with you. Because generally, if something really resonates with you and you feel kind of called to learn more about that, there's probably a reason for that. And you should follow that. No matter which one you're getting into, do your research. Yeah, um, that's you, important. Yeah, yeah, super wink, important. Wink, wink. <laughs> well, thanks for watching, guys, and we will see you next time. Bye, Garnet. Bye, Garnet.